Well, hello again. Thank you for joining us for the Revelation Bible Study. My name is Pastor Jason Hughes, and this is a ministry of Idlewild Baptist Church in Matthews, North Carolina. If you'd like to find out more about our church, or if you'd like to donate and help in our ministry, uh, you can find out more information at our website, www.idlewildbaptist.org, and you can give online, or you can, can send in your support by mail. We really appreciate your generosity to support this ministry. This ministry is all about the glory of Jesus Christ and advancing His gospel uh, to our community and to the world. Well, I hope that you've had a great week, and I hope that you're growing in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and His grace. I hope that you're doing well. And, um, you know, I know that even in difficult moments, God can use those times to draw us close to His word and that word really speaks to our soul and gives us the nourishment we need to get through uh, trials. God is faithful always. Well today we pick up where we left off and um, again I want to thank you for the feedback I've received. Um, you know I prayerfully am doing my best uh, at this study and um, I really really enjoy uh, this privilege to be able to lead a Bible study so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into Revelation chapter 2 today. Dear Father, we come before you now in the name of Christ, and we pray for your help, that you would guide us and protect us from error. As we look to your word, we pray that our souls might be nourished, because uh, we understand uh, that your word is infallible, inerrant, that it is God-breathed, and every word of it is profitable for uh, all types of things. To train us in righteousness is our ultimate goal, to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and His grace. Father, I pray for everyone that uh, you may uh, bring to this video, that you would bless them today, that you would help them draw closer to you. I particularly think about those who may not trust Christ as their Savior, that you would use this study to draw them to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the only Savior the only name under heaven by which men shall be saved, according to the Bible. Father, we thank you for what you've done for us in Christ, that you died as Jesus in, in the flesh, as God in the flesh. In Jesus, you died for our sins, so that we might be reconciled to you, might be forgiven of our sins, and might be the heirs of your incredible inheritance as partakers of light, eternal life, and just the amazing uh, glory of being in your presence. Father, we just praise you today and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I want to uh, begin today uh, just by stating that last time, if you remember, I referred to uh, three different ways we can view Revelation. Uh, and here's how they are. In verses 17 through 19, particularly in 19, we see that Jesus himself, the Lord, tells John to write down things um, which he has seen, things which are, and things which will take place. And that really is a great way to understand Revelation apart from the fact that it's received in four separate visions, which I also talked about in a previous lesson. Uh, just so that you understand, Revelation is comprised of four visions, and within those four visions, we see things that John has seen, things that are currently in John's time, and things that will take place in the future from John's time. And I'm, I'm going to try to be faithful to kind of mark out those, those distinctions. Today is one of those distinctions because as we move into chapter 2 and specifically the, the seven letters to the church, uh, we move from the things John has seen to the things that are. In other words, the indication is that the, the, the have seen are things that, that John witnessed and the things that are, are the things that John is going to record for the church in the first century. And then the remainder of Revelation, from chapter 4 through 22, 
will be all about the things that will take place. Hopefully that's not uh, that confusing, but it would help you have a little bit of a, a marker about um, how the book is actually divided. Here's another artist um, depiction of Christ, and you see the seven lamps. Uh, you see an attempt there to kind of capture his glory, um, that resplendent brilliance. Uh, he's surrounded by the saints, by the elders. There's some seraphim, uh, angelic beings there. Uh, it's just always been fascinating to me to, to think about some of the images that the Bible uh, gives us of God, and um, I hope you're just as amazed by him as I am. So when we move into these seven letters in um, Revelation 2 through, 2 and 3 rather, uh, the question is really what does Jesus think of the church? Wow, what a relevant question for every generation, particularly ours in this time, in this climate, especially in the Western church. Kendall Easley uh, says that Jesus knows the strengths and the weaknesses of each local congregation and gives them the proper compliments and challenges. He's re referring to chapter 2 and 3. And today we're going to take a look at the first three letters. Uh, and here is a map. Now earlier I showed you this map. I want you to see where Asia Minor is. Um, you can can see that this is Turkey and here is the land bridge that connects Asia and Europe and right here is the city of Istanbul which used to be Constantinople named after the Emperor Constantine who made uh, Christianity the official religion of Rome in the third century. Here's another map that may help you um, Notice uh, Jerusalem is down here, if that gives you bearing. Um, Africa, of course, below. Another map uh, zooms in a little closer and shows you kind of the circuitous nature of um, these seven churches. Some scholars believe it was really uh, on a mail route, that there was a mail route that connected these cities in uh, Asia Minor. And what you should no, what would be, be, be beneficial to know, rather, is that Ephesus was really the huge metropolis. And surrounding uh, Ephesus, uh, you know, within 100 miles, you get all these other places. And uh, some of them were not small by any stretch of the imagination, um, but compared to Ephesus, they were. All right, the first thing that we want to point out is that as we look at the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, there is a pattern for these letters. There is a, 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 a regular formula for, for these letters, and this is how it goes. It, each letter begins with a characteristic of Jesus that's drawn from chapter 1 of Revelation. Remember these, the amazing depiction of the, the unveiled glory of Jesus that we've studied over the past two weeks. So every letter will begin by referencing, generally, Revelation 1. The next part of the letter will be a word of commendation, if appropriate. In other words, Jesus will commend particular churches for a certain quality or characteristic, and he does that m most often, but not always. The third is criticism for their sins, their shortcomings, and their weaknesses. And we see that two of the churches, uh, in particular today, do not receive criticism. Fourth, there is a word of correction or warning, if necessary. And then fifth, the last component of each of these letters is a challenge and a promise that are all drawn from the end of Revelation. Uh, chapters 19 through 22. Uh, this is uh, some the characteristics of the seven letters, and I've, I've taken this outline uh, from uh, Danny Aiken in his commentary. But it's a great uh, formula for us to 
understand what we're going to be looking for as we study these individual letters. Well, let's hit the text. Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's talk about the characteristics that we see. First, we see the characteristic of Christ that's mentioned. And it's a perfect one to begin these letters with because it reminds us who is giving us this message to these churches and what his particular station is. Of course, it's the Lord Jesus, the unveiled glory of the Son of God. And we saw him in the midst of the seven lampstands, which he told us in verse 20 of chapter 1 was the church. And he's reminding us again in the first letter that he operates amidst his church. He knows each congregation and he knows what's going on. And he judges accordingly because he is a just judge along with being a savior. Next we see the commendation. Here's what the church of Ephesus is doing really well. They have great works, which would be spiritual evidence fruit. Uh, they, they persevere through toils and tribulations. They have endurance. They persevere. And they have an intolerance of evil. They've already shown that they have a discerning wisdom, a knowledge of the Word of God that helped them determine some false apostles in their actions and their words. And the indication is that they got rid of those who were teaching false gospel or false doctrine. But then we get to the criticism. And the Church of Ephesus uh, is targeted or singled out by the Lord himself because they've abandoned their first love. Next, Jesus offers a correction and a warning. And he tells them specifically, first, remember, second, repent, and then third, return to your first works, or there'll be consequences. And he, he says specifically he will remove the lampstand, and, and that just can also be thought of as his him extinguishing the light of that church. Um, and certainly, uh, when we get into analyzing the diagnosis for the church of Ephesus, we can see how uh, if they remain in these patterns, certainly their church will die. Finally, we see the challenge and the promise that Jesus offers. And remember, all of these promises come from the end of Revelation. And the promise there, which will apply to all Christians, not just the church of Ephesus, is that you will eat from the tree of life in paradise. So I want to kind of come back and, and make sure we review that principle. These are specific letters to seven specific churches in Asia Minor during the first century. But they also apply universally to the church. All those throughout the centuries who are born-again believers in Jesus Christ these letters have real uh, practical applications for us as well. Uh, some actually interpret these letters as suggestive of certain periods of time in history, as if uh, the Ephesus church letter refers to the early church, with the final church, Laodicea, uh, referring to the last era of church in this age. And I don't really believe that that's warranted at all. And most scholars, uh, conservative scholars, uh, Dr. Aiken, Paige Patterson, uh, Craig Keener, and more would not agree with that type of 
uh, almost dispensational view of these seven letters. What you need to know is that they're letters to specific churches, but also universally applied, meant to be circulated among Christians until the return of Christ. All right, so let's dive in a little deeper and try to understand what's going on in Ephesus. I mean, they've got great works, and they even have a great commitment to orthodoxy, which is right teaching or sound doctrine. I mean, on the outside, it seems like everything's fine. The, what's the problem? Well, the problem seems to be that they have the right actions, but they have the wrong motivation. Uh, Dr. Aiken is very helpful uh, with, in his commentary on this particular letter, and um, he points out that their obedience had become an obligation out of duty, not out of love for Jesus. And when Jesus compels them to return to their first love, what he's saying is, you were accepted by me when you trusted in me as your Savior and I forgave your sins. Obey me out of love for me, not out of duty. In other words, we also need to be mindful of this and remember when we first became Christians, how we walked with Jesus in love. We didn't relate to him because of somehow we had earned special favor through our works. We were just enamored by his marvelous grace that he would have saved and died and saved a sinner like me, right? That, that was how we felt. We were just incredibly grateful for his grace and his forgiveness. And uh, it's interesting how a Christian can begin with that kind of understanding and knowledge of the incredible, amazing grace of Jesus. But slowly, as they uh, participate in the church, they begin to adopt a form of legalism. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Of course, the promise at the end about the tree of life it really is symbolic of the presence and the provision of God in heaven. Um, it's the tree of life that we see in the Garden of Eden, the, the one that Adam and Eve lost. And of course, Jesus has won back uh, that access to that tree of life. Uh, this is uh, all-encompassing, a spiritual nourishment, eternal nourishment, eternal life, eternal life in the presence of the living God, um, fellowship with Him, all the amazing joys of being in His presence forever. Uh, there is a question about, is this entirely symbolic? And I've often wondered about that myself. Uh, as we get into the end of Revelation, we'll talk about this more because there's some real specific details about the tree of life in heaven. But there was a literal tree in the Garden of Eden. And uh, many wonder, does this just mean a symbolic um, type of meaning that represents how God's presence and provision will take care of us for, forever? Or would there really, literally be uh, this amazing fruit that will nourish us. Those are questions that we'll reserve to the end of our study. Let me say a word about the Nicolaitans. Um, in this, these first seven verses, uh, Jesus commends the church of Ephesus for hating the Nicolaitans, and he says he hates them too. So who are these folks? Well, from the early church fathers, scholars have kind of deduced that the Nicolaitans were a heretical group in the early church who really taught immorality and idolatry. Um, they're condemned in this verse 2-6 and also we'll see that they're condemned in verse 15 of chapter 2 as well uh, because of their practices in Ephesus and Pergamum or Pergamos. Um, we also learn that Thyatira apparently had resisted the false prophecy they preached, and we'll see that next time. But often the Nicolaitans in their teaching are uh, linked to the heresy taught by Balaam, and you can see that in Numbers, uh, and we'll talk about it more in the next letter. But this is really uh, seems to be about uh, incorporating and compromising in pagan religions that were just everywhere in Asia Minor during the first century. And as they assimilated into pagan culture, they really became uh, nominal or really totally abandoned uh, 
the gospel and became very worldly. Um, and of course, that corrupted uh, anyone who is deceived to believe their version of Christianity. What this really comes down to is license and licentiousness. License is this idea that, well, Jesus paid all my sins, I can go do what I want. And, of course, that is not what the gospel says. The gospel says that if you go out and sin recklessly, uh, you're trampling on the blood of Jesus. That because of the victory of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, we have the power to turn away from sin, and we ought to be making war against sin, claiming our victory over sin by faith in what Jesus has accomplished, becoming more like him, walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. Licentiousness is, is really debauchery and um, uh, immorality. And, and really what this is about is people claiming to be Christian and claiming that they have the grace to do whatever they want. So under the guise of Christian liberty, they're out committing all kinds of um, uh, sexual and uh, spiritual evil. And a lot of this is, is again, is tied into the, the rich heritage of paganism in Asia Minor during this time. Um, before we move to the next part of the text, I just want to say one word about legalism. Legalism is the opposite of license. Legalism is when people begin to create so many rules to try to live a life that pleases God that they also go to an extreme. And they really start to work to earn their, their favor with God, their relationship with God. Um, we see this when, you know, Jesus tells them to, you know, they've abandoned their first love. Um, in other words, legalism is, is obeying to be accepted. And, and, and that really totally uh, diverges from what the gospel actually teaches us. The gospel teaches us that we receive a free gift of salvation. We don't earn it. Uh, God's amazing grace pardons our sin by his shed blood. And we have victory over that through his resurrection. We die with Christ and we are raised with Christ to newness of life. We walk in the Spirit. And so we obey out of our love for Jesus, not because we think we can earn uh, a particular rung on the ladder to heaven. But think about this. If, if you're in an environment where there's debauchery and people claiming to be Christians like the Nicolaitans and they're out doing all kinds of evil, you can see how very subtly a desire to stay pure and live a holy life that honors God, Satan can come at you a different way and, and, and kind of undercut the beauty of the gospel and all of a sudden you're trying to follow rules all the time. You're judging everybody else for not following the rules. You become... Uh, you know, very different than a New Covenant Christian should look like. And I just think this is interesting that, that this, this happened to Ephesus. I mean, they, they had the right teaching. They, they, everything seemed right. But they, unlike the Nicolaitans, that, that really went uh, to a point where they totally, um, you know, took advantage of the grace of God. Uh, the the Ephesian Christians perhaps were, were being attacked in a different way where they had abandoned that amazing realization of the beauty of God's grace and they had begun to be these works-based Christians. And we know that we're not saved by works. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 uh, is a gift of God because no one can boast, uh, so that no one can boast. So I, I, that is just... Uh, some additional things that I thought would be helpful for you to think through. Let's move on to the second part of the passage. Revelation 2, 8 through 11. And the angel of the church in Smyrna write, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. 
Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, here we are moving on to the second letter to the church of Smyrna. And there's a few things that um, we can point out. Um, first, oh, let me read verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So that again is the promise drawn from Revelation 19-22. through Alright, so here we go. Um, the first characteristic of Christ the letter begins with is that He is the first and the last. Um, this is another way of saying um, the Alpha and the Omega, in a way. Uh, and He is the one who died and came to life. He is our resurrected Lord. And we see that in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 1. His commendation to the church of Smyrna is that they have persevered in tribulation, and they have persevered in poverty, and they persevered even when they're being slandered. Interesting enough, they're doing such a good job that Jesus has no criticism for them, and thereby he has no correction or warning for them either. And finally, the challenge or the promise that is drawn from the end of Revelation is do not fear, be faithful, you will receive the crown of life and not experience the second death. Oh, what a comfort and encouragement this must be for so many uh, Christians who have faced persecution throughout the centuries. Uh, Smyrna was really a hotbed for persecution because it was a hub of pagan worship. They worshiped a lot of different gods. Uh, Diana would be one of them. Uh, and it was also a central place for Judaism. And both of these groups take offense to the gospel. Uh, one of the early church fathers, Tertullian, famously said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Uh, that is really a paraphrase of what he said entirely, but um, he said this in the second century. And um, he himself became a martyr. Shockingly, it's estimated that today, 100,000 Christians are martyred every year. And that's just a really mind-boggling number. And sadly, that persecution is on the rise. It's on the increase. You know, for us in America, in the Western Church, at least until you know this recent generation, we, we really have enjoyed incredible liberty from God's grace uh, under our, our nation and our freedom of religion. But it does seem like that is slowly er eroding. And, uh, you know, I think if anything, based on the trends we see, we need to be prepared that perhaps in the future we may have to face more intense persecution, uh, more slander. Uh, you know, it's almost like in Smyrna, you can practice your faith privately, no problem, but you better not speak up about it publicly. And doesn't that sound like America? Well, God promises that he will reward the martyrs with special honors. Uh, we see that throughout uh, Scripture. And um, it's, it's just very interesting, the parallels between uh, then and now. You know, 2,000 years later, uh, the Bible still is practical and relevant and needed uh, to comfort Christians who are being persecuted. Isn't it interesting that it says that the Smyrna Christians lived in poverty, but Christ considered them rich? It certainly shatters uh, the perspective by the world's standards. You know, God um, doesn't count material wealth as anything uh, other than something temporary. What he counts as wealth or riches is, um, of course, having Christ, being in Christ, and eternal things. Also, it's amazing that Jesus comforts them and tells them not to be afraid. And he says that he will be with them and that they would face more persecution. It's also interesting that he uh, says uh, that the devil, the accuser of the brethren, is going to throw them in prison. And that shows us that the enemy and uh, principalities of darkness, uh, demons, and uh, those who follow Satan are at work and behind 
the persecution of God's people. And it's always been that way. And it will increasingly get that, be more obvious uh, until the end where it's, it's just blatant, where the Antichrist rises and uh, uh, commits the abomination of desolation and, and demands that people worship him as a god instead of the true uh, God, our Lord and Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus promises the, those who remain faithful amid or amidst persecution the crown of life. He says specifically that they will have eternal life and not face the second death. And no, This is not talking about physical death. They certainly did face physical death. This is about spiritual and eternal death, what the Bible calls the second death. It, it literally is uh, referring to being thrown in the lake of fire, which we see in Revelation 20:14. If you're curious about what it means to overcome and receive the crown of life and not face the second death, John, in his epistle, 1 John, his letter, um, teaches us all Christians, all born-again believers in Jesus, will overcome by faith. Here's what he says exactly. He says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And the implication there is, is our faith in Jesus Christ, and you can uh, see that if you go back and look at uh, that fifth chapter. What is this interesting phrase, the synagogue of Satan, in verse 9 of chapter 2? Well, here's a great quote from MacArthur that helps. With the rejection of the Messiah, Judaism becomes as much as a tool of Satan as emperor worship. Okay, so his, his observation there is, if they don't belong to the Lord, if they've rejected the Messiah, whether they know it or not, they're being used by the enemy. This obviously goes back to a very important principle in the Bible, which we see in John 8, 44, where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he tells them that they are children of the devil. And these are Jews. These are people with a physical descendant. Um, they are descendants, physical descendants, a lineage from Abraham. And they're saying, hey, our father is Abraham. And Jesus is saying, no, your father is the father of lies, Satan. And what this really is about is about being spiritual, spiritual sons of Abraham, being spiritually born again versus physical descendants. I would say that God does have a plan for the elect Jewish people. And we see that in Romans 11, 25 through 27. And we'll learn more about that as we progress through Revelation. And we know today there's plenty of Messianic Jews, uh, Jewish people who have uh, correctly identified Jesus as the Messiah. They are born-again Christians, and they are very delightful um, and can really help us in, in great ways because they understand so much of the Old Testament so richly. Um, and so uh, I am thankful to the Lord's faithfulness to his covenant promises. I do want to say that any type of anti-Semitism is an ungodly sin, just like all racism. And uh, when we read passages about the Jews being responsible for crucifying Jesus, or passages like this where we see uh, really like unbelieving Jews as the enemy of Christ, that is, has historically been used to sin. It's been used as a justification to sin against uh, you know, a people that God loves. And, uh, of course, we see that horrifically in uh, World War II and the Holocaust. And, um, you know, there's no justification for that or any type of racism. God made every color and every people, and he loves them. And as we're going to see in Revelation 5, 4 and 5, uh, there will be people who are saved from every tribe, nation, and tongue, every people. Uh, heaven is going to be a wonderfully diverse place, and there's beauty in that diversity. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. We all are sinners in need of an extravagant grace. So just take time and look up Acts 17.26, especially in the context of what we're going through right now in our country. Um, there may be debates about is there systemic racism or isn't there systemic racism? The bottom line is there should be no racism, and I think all Christians can agree with that, and that is about the kingdom of God much more than it's about 
uh, this nation. But Acts 17, 26 is definitive from God. It says, from one blood, every nation has, has been made. And uh, so it's just food for thought for Christians to navigate. Um, I don't think we have to buy into some of the political narratives that are driving some of the um, activism that's happening under the guise of racial equality. But there's no doubt about it. We can stand up and say racial equality is a biblical principle. Racism is a sin. I have no problem with that. And I think any Christian who doesn't want to say that because they think they're going to be lumped into some kind of political activism, um, we need to be careful because we're supposed to be bright lights in the world, not of the world, but certainly shining a light brightly for Jesus. And Jesus loves all people. Now, with all that said, I will say that particularly with Black Lives Matter, I'm supportive of any effort they make for racial equality as long as it's civil and not violent. However, if you look at their page and you start to understand some of the things that they're in support of, there's much more uh, than meets the eye. Uh, they have a very liberal agenda. Uh, it's, it seems to be uh, almost infused around the LGBTQ plus agenda. And it's just not entirely about racial equality. And so that's certainly something that our nation is going through. That's something the church should be praying for. Never should anyone be mistreated because of the color of their skin. Never should uh, police officers uh, be violent or uh, take advantage of people with their authority and power. But that doesn't mean that we can't stand up and say that racism is wrong or we should support our police because they are the brave men and women that keep us safe. I, I realize I'm going down a rabbit hole with this, but it's so pertinent right now in our culture. Um, I think we ought to be able to stand up confidently without compromise and say, this is right, this is wrong, and I'm not going to play the political game. Of course, we can't roll over if public policy uh, continues to move in an unhealthy direction, uh, like defunding the police. I don't think that's right either, because God tells us in Romans 13 that the government is actually a grace to us to restrain evil. And let me tell you, the minute we didn't have police officers in our land, the minute things would truly become chaotic. Uh, violent, violent, violent uh, culture would, uh, and, and we already see that in big cities like Chicago, New York, places where they have chosen to lower their police budget and their policing strategies. I digress. I know that it's a inflammatory topic, but um, we as Christians ought to be able to discuss it, um, you know, fairly, um, and part of the problem in our country now is that there's no discourse between uh, sides. It, it's all animosity, and um, sadly, there is a great moral divide under that guise of political differences. All right, let's move on to the third letter. Verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has the ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. First off, we see the characteristic of Christ is that Jesus has a sharp double-edged sword which comes from his mouth. 
Uh, this is the spoken word, um, and it is uh, certainly suggest his judgment, his perfect, just judgment. Uh, we see Hebrews 4:12 and, and 13 as a uh, really great cross reference to this. We talked about that. The Word of God is living and active. It's like a double-edged sword. It's a discerner of our thoughts and intentions. Um, James calls it a mirror that we look into and we see our true state. The commendation for the Christians at Pergamos is that they're, they're being faithful. They're honoring Jesus. And many of them are refusing to deny Christ amidst incredible persecution. Their criticism is that some of them have compromised. And they have really turned to idolatry, worshiping other gods. And with that always follows immorality. Dr. Aiken says nothing will poison the body of Christ like the poison of compromise. He makes a great point that in the Church of Pergamos, it's not that they are allowing evil forces from outside to get in. It's that inside, compromise has occurred, and that corruption has caused great division uh, throughout the history of the church. And we've heard stories, uh, and we've probably even been in churches where we've seen great pain and hurt and conflict and division and all of it comes from compromise, compromising the Word of God. Finally, the challenge and the promise is to receive my hidden manna, a white stone and a new name. We see that in verses 12 of chapter 19. Let's talk about the diagnostic picture. Jesus commended the faithful Christians in Pergamos, but warned and threatened those who had compromised the church from within by assimilating with pagan culture and its debauchery. Jesus commands those who have compromised the truth with libertine false doctrine to repent, or he will come and fight against them personally. Now, if that's not a warning, I don't know what is. He certainly refers to Balaam and the Nicolaitans, and they have much in common. And it's really, again, about paganism and immorality. And it led to compromise amongst the people of God. You know, we see this a lot in the Western church today. In uh, a, an attempt to be inclusive, churches of God have totally compromised the truth. In an attempt to, in, in an attempt to, to almost uh, always be accepting that people have totally abandoned the life-giving and saving gospel. And so, you know, we as Christians have to be very careful that we don't compromise ever the Word of God. I love the, the story of Adrian Rogers during um, the time in the Southern Baptist Convention where really the, uh, the authority and the inerrancy of the Bible was uh, being debated uh, very vigorously. And he, at the time, was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, and it was so um, tumultuous that each side of this debate had, were represented by attorneys. And uh, on the one side, where certain folks were arguing for compromise, for actually not holding fast to the authority of the Word of God, uh, their particular attorney approached Dr. Rogers, who was on the conservative side uh, for the inerrancy of Scripture, and he said, you know, what gives? You, you need to compromise. And uh, I probably will misquote this, but to give you an idea, I'll paraphrase. Dr. Akins, or excuse me, Dr. Adrian Rogers said, you know what? I don't have to be uh, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and, and I don't have to be a pastor of this church and he said I don't, I don't even have to be alive but the one thing I will never do is compromise the Word of God it's very powerful and if you can look up the quote yourself uh, it, it, it's much better uh, when it's word for word but you know that's the kind of passion that Christians should have God hates it when his people compromise and intermingle with the world and allow the world to affect them remember James 4 4 to be friends with the world is enmity with God. One of the things that some scholars argue is that Pergamos was a real central hub for emperor worship. 
And particularly, uh, there were all types of temples, uh, not only to the emperor, there were three emperor temples, but there was also many other temples, um, including some very unique ones there. And some, some scholars like Dr. Aiken and others argue that, you know, it seems like a, a patriotism for Pergamum as the revered capital made its way into the church and slowly some of the members became friends with the world, which is enmity with God. Now, we have to be careful there because we could fall into the same traps. Uh, really, we are uh, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And Dr. Aiken says something like this. He says, when people get teary-eyed over the star-spangled banner and, um, you know, oh, beautiful for spacious skies uh, and not over amazing grace, we've got a problem. America has become an idol. Now, as I've said many times, I love our country and the principles it's founded on, and that's why I serve it in the United States military. Um, but don't get me wrong. I, as Billy Graham says, I don't put my trust in Washington. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so should you. And we have to be on guard against any type of idolatry. And sadly, I do think that some um, folks that are in the church have gotten to a point where they've made America and a particular brand of politics more important than representing the kingdom of the living God. In this letter, we hear about Antipas. Now, there's not much known about him. Some people think he could have been the pastor of the church. But what we find out is that he has, he has died for his faith in Jesus. The church in Pergamos is under severe persecution as well. Church tradition actually claims that he was martyred inside a brass bull. It was very horrific. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very interesting that the, the word martyr, it's a Greek word, it actually means witness. But because of all the persecution that these early church witnesses for Christ went through, the word martyr eventually became known, uh, it took on its meaning that it has today. Somebody who has died for their faith. That's how regularly Christians were dying for Jesus during this time. And of course, we know that it continues today. Now what is this business about the temple of Satan? Now this is interesting. There's a lot of different theories. I, I've already mentioned to you there were so many temples, pagan temples in Pergamos. Um, there was one that's very unique. It's called the Acropolis. It was up on a huge hill and it was a, a very unique and huge temple to Zeus. Uh, there was emperor temples. I mentioned that. And there's also a lot of others of different gods and goddesses. There were cults throughout Pergamos too. I mean this was uh, such a pagan society. It, it, we're headed that way for sure with secularism but I don't know that we've experienced anything like this. But the question is, is the temple of Satan a generality for all this paganism, which is certainly not of God and is of Satan, or is it a specific reference? And I'll share with you a very interesting uh, historical fact. Um, on top of the Acropolis, or top of the, this, this mountain overlooking Smyrna, was where that temple of Zeus was, and it's called the Acropolis. And uh, interestingly enough, in the early 1930s, uh, Germany uh, procured the remaining temple of Zeus and moved it to Berlin. And shortly after that, it was put in a, it was put in a museum at first, but shortly after that, Hitler and the Nazi party, which is very much known for their occultism, learned about it and actually had a huge edifice designed in the image of this uh, temple. And actually in Nuremberg, where uh, Hitler actually reveals for the first time his final solution, he's standing on a, on a throne that looks very much like the Acropolis. And, you know, we know the evil that came out of uh, that with the Holocaust. It's very interesting. You can do some research on it yourself. Um, I think the main point is that um, 
this is a real domain of darkness and that the church of Pergamos is really a bright light in the midst of tremendous evil and you know we have to think about that that really is our job and if it's God's will for us to face this type of intense persecution we have to trust that he will sustain us and really we have to make our faith uh, you know uh, one way to say it is the the um, our faith is like the rubber that meets the road. When you face intense persecution, we're going to find out very quickly how confident you are in the claims of Christ and the coming eternal kingdom uh, or not. And uh, this is a, it's a long discussion. There's uh, a lot of stories in Fox's Book of Martyrs that talk about brave men and women that went to their death for Jesus and God provided them amazing supernatural grace um, and I don't have the time today to get into some of those stories but you can uh, pick up a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs and read all about uh, brave women, men and women who have paved the way um, as faithful witnesses martyrs for Jesus alright moving forward um, there is some mention about hidden manna uh, this may be symbolic of spiritual nourishment eternally but also we cannot forget about the spiritual nourishment or the spiritual food that God provides us in Christ now. I mean, after all, He is the bread of life. And as we fellowship with Him and look to Him and His Word and pray to Him and uh, seek His will for our life, we are nourished. And um, it's just amazing that uh, you know, Jesus is reminding us and encouraging us that He will be our portion forever. And then, then there's the mysterious white stone. And, um, you know, it's very interesting. Um, some say this could be a judicial marker because in those times during a trial, when it came time for the verdict, if it was guilty, it would be a black stone. And if it was innocent, it would be a white stone. And maybe the jurors used those stones um, to kind of show what, what they had decided. Other people, other scholars, think that you know during that time there was often pebbles used as admission tickets to banquets and different uh, kind of civil um, gatherings. We don't quite know what this white stone is. Uh, it's it is a great mystery. It's very neat, um, but what we can really conclude is that it, it very much symbolizes the acceptance and the victory that we will experience by Christ, because of Christ, through Christ, in Christ. Um, and then it says on that stone we'll have a new name. And, and Denny Aiken states that this stone points to the marriage supper of the Lamb and intimate fellowship with the risen Lord. And he bases that off of uh, Revelation 3.12 where we, we learn that you know we're going to be with God and uh, He's going to call us by his name and will be his people in his city. Uh, you can look at that yourself. Uh, G.K. Bill says, to receive the kingly name of Jesus, no one knows except himself. And so, in a way, this could be about being accepted as a child of God and having his name written on our foreheads, which also may be symbolic. You know, these are one of those times where we can't go beyond what the text teaches us. We can explore, but we have to be very careful. Okay, well, I know that um, that was a lot. We went through three of the seven letters, uh, verses 1 through 17, and um, I hope that you uh, found it helpful, um, despite my uh, commentary, and uh, you know how amazing this is that we get to see Jesus actually combing through his churches and we get to see his righteous judgment pointing out what needs to be worked on and what they're doing well and certainly he is doing the same thing for our church today and so we need to really take these lessons very seriously um, we don't need to compromise uh, we, we don't need to we need to guard our hearts against idolatry we need to stand up for the truth um, we need to face persecution bravely and show that our faith is authentic, um, especially if 
things get worse in our country. And, um, you know, I think many uh, Christian scholars, uh, you know, they're, they're making some predictions that the more that secularism rises in our nation, the more uh, pressure we're going to face on, on all types of issues. Um, but no matter what, we know that God is faithful. He's going to sustain us. His grace is sufficient. And that's true for you today in the challenges of your life as well. I um, am certainly available. If any of you have questions, you can email me at pastorjason at idlewildbaptist.org. Um, but I really appreciate your time today. You know, I, I want to say uh, one final thing. We, we, I talked a little bit about our cultural issues with racial equality. I don't think it's a bad idea that those of us who are Caucasian take time and think about how it may be different for other people. Um, I think that's healthy. I think that might be a very um, mature perspective as a Christian, a follower of Christ, putting ourselves in other people's shoes. However, I don't think it's correct or godly in a mass stereotype to claim that all Caucasians are racist. And I get that that's kind of the, the feeling uh, behind some of this activism and some of these uh, theories, critical race theory and white fragility. Um, listen, I, I love black people before this happened and I know that you did too as Christians because you have the love of Jesus in your heart. And that goes along with any other color as well. As well, And I think some people just get offended that, you know, I wasn't a racist before and you're calling me a racist now. I get that. I, under, I understand that feeling. It's like a defensive feeling. I mean, I grew up in North Carolina in the South. And uh, listen, my best friend in, in uh, second grade was um, a black boy named Mark. And we had a great time together. And... In public school in North Carolina, I was taught from a very early age that racism was wrong. To me, that shows the progress our nation had made since the 60s. This was in the mid-80s. Um, so, it, it certainly, uh, I know that it's causing a lot of people uh, a lot of anxiety. And we have to really just pray and intercede and um, uh, continue to love people. Uh, even when they're saying things that aren't true about us, perhaps. Um, and we need to, you know, be involved in civil discourse and uh, certainly stand up when our freedoms of, of religion and freedom of speech is, when the Constitution is being kind of walked on, I think there is a role for Christians to be um, responsible citizens. But never, never should we... Um, begin to respond with evil, to evil with evil. If somebody mistreats us or says something that's not true, or uh, I think you get my point. So it's kind of a balancing act right now as we walk with the Lord in this unique time. But uh, let me just pray for us and we'll be dismissed. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your love and your mercy. I thank you that you are on your throne and nothing happens apart from your sovereign plan. You're not knocked off that throne. You don't fall asleep at the wheel. There's not one problem that's too hard for you. No, you're sovereign over kings and nations. You are sovereign over everything. There's not one molecule in all of this amazingly vast 92 billion light year universe that you're not sovereign over. And we praise your holy name for that. Lord, we know when um, things are uh, difficult and we see uh, families going through difficulties when we deal with physical sicknesses when we deal with cultural challenges Lord it's easy to become overwhelmed with anxiety but help us to stay steadfast in trusting you to lean on you to cast our cares on you to lift up all the people of this nation before you in prayer to love everyone, even those that may be mistreating others. Um, Father, 
I pray that you would help heal our land if that's your will. But if it's not, I trust you ultimately know what you're doing and you're doing it perfectly. Father, we pray that you would help our local congregation to continue to show the love of Jesus, that we love everybody, no matter where they're from or what they look like, we love them. And um, Lord, we're all equal at the foot of your cross. Thank you so much for your mercy and your grace. We love you, Father, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for tuning in again today. I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon, evening, and we'll see you next time. God bless you. Bye-bye.